Uh, so after the Cold War, the world has gone from a bipolar uh, to a multipolar, or you could say initially also unipolar for a while, but let's, let's say for now a multipolar world. What effect has this had on the African countries, uh, in particular those rich in resources? So what is the significance of also the fall of the Berlin Wall for Africa? Uh, did anything change, and if so, what changed at that moment in time? Well, as you know, during the Cold War, we had a period of uh, competition for ideology. Now the United States was telling us that uh, if the communists won the Cold War, then they're going to act unilaterally, they're going to impose their politics on us, and uh, we're going to force all of us to become communists. On the other side, what really happened is that finally the Western ideology of free enterprise of capitalism prevailed. And sadly, people of the third world, we saw a United States which started to behave a little bit in the way they said the communists would have behaved if they had won. They started to act unilaterally. And uh, they started also to marginalize, you know, the bargaining position which many third world nation, nation in Africa, possess. Because the United States had emerged as the supreme superpower. Now, at that time, the United States was in a unique position to bring about a more significant uh, reduction in nuclear armament. They could have easily compelled the s former Soviet Union or turned to Russia to a uh, uh, higher level of demilitarization in the nuclear field. Unfortunately, what we saw, we saw the United States going to their own Congress asking for billions to develop something even more powerful, which they call small news. Despite the fact that they were, uh, as we know afterwards, been pointing at Saddam Hussein as being somebody who was busy in building up well, nuclear or weapons for mass destruction. So there was a, an inconsistency there. I believe that uh, you could see, because before the leaders of third world nation were also taking advantage of the division in this ideological conflict in playing one block against another. As I pointed out earlier this morning, you see some leaders going to Moscow, if they didn't get what they wanted there, then they would turn to Washington. And this came along. Now, after the Cold War, the United States, as we saw it for quite a long time, for quite some time, enjoyed a supreme position. And unfortunately, they violated, in many respects, the law of traditional diplomacy, they did what they want. Some people wrote a special report called Peace Americana, Peace in the American Way. They said, we America today, we have become so powerful that we can take decision the way we want. Then many people outside will react, will criticize us. But if they were in our position, they would have acted in their own national interest. That, I think, shocked many of us who had been on the sides of the West, United States, during the Cold War. And we could see that uh, the attitude of government there, really, was not consistent with traditional diplomacy. Diplomacy started to take a knock by this attitude. We saw the emergence of a situation where before we had been educated to believe that 
right is might. Suddenly we saw a new sort of development that might is right. Now in the aftermath of all these wars now, I think also the world has realized that the best thing for the world would be for us to go back to a situation of multipolarity where there's more than one block in the world. And uh, Africa, in this context, in the global village of today, must have realized that it is not ideology which is going to solve the problem. They've got to face the reality of the world as it is. They are finally on their own, everybody's going to come along for their own interest. In Africa, therefore, must create its own cohesion, its own internal understanding. At least this must be the view of the more matured leadership within Africa. And as I kept on elaborating this morning, I believe the future the priority of Africa is to be able to get a better cohesion within Africa. You've got to confront a nation like China, big and united. You've got the United States, and you've got Europe enlarging and becoming. You've got India. Now, Africa cannot remain fragmented, divided against itself by all these internal conflicts. And we must bring about, therefore, that new leadership which we are lacking and which we are searching. From the very word go that we've started to realize that this is necessary, I think we are already on the good track. Thank you. Ambassador Rimdap, as an ambassador representing uh, a country very, very rich in resources, what effect did this shift have on Nigeria, uh, moving from a, a bipolar to a multipolar world? I think, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, the, I think the the fall of the Berlin Wall and the uh, the, the the division of uh, the wall in those days uh, between the uh, the capitalist world and the communist and the influence in Africa. Uh, I think the, it, it, to us in in Nigeria, where we have uh, uh, we call ourselves non-aligned. Uh, non aligned, I mean, we're not aligned to any of the, of the superpowers' uh, issues. So, uh, Nigeria, like, uh, like most uh, African countries, belong to the non aligned. We, despite we have this ideology, there are a lot of uh, scrambling in those days to be get a spare of influence. Whereby, a lot of, uh, uh, because of the ideology and the, uh, of the West, particularly uh, United States and, uh, and, and Russia, uh, it also even transcended into the issue of uh, the scramble for resources. So in our case, uh, uh, when we talk about the major resources like uh, the oil, it was discovered in Nigeria in 1957. And so since then, a lot of uh, oil companies, all these resources did not belong to the government. In fact, it, was, it belonged to the companies. Companies were getting royalties. Uh, you know, they were paying royalties, to, to, but they, whatever they have they're taking, they take it back to their countries. Really, we give them, uh, uh, and in those days, give them uh, a spare of land, and then they, 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 they pay royalties to the government. That was all. Until the Nigeria joined the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Therefore, we now talk about the, the, the issue of uh, control of resources by the countries, uh, spearheaded by Algeria, in order to get. Uh, the open countries come together. So since then, uh, we, there's a lot of uh, uh, pressure on us. Uh, and then with the, with the, with the, with the changes, uh, whereby these days we don't have, uh, uh, in fact, uh, also we were, uh, our foreign policy and ideas were dominated by the events in the decolonization of Africa. Because that's one of the major uh, problems that uh, we were faced before independence or after independence because even independence in African countries were not in one soup. 
uh, only recently some uh, got themselves out of uh, the, 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 the problems of uh, being ruled from countries uh, like, for instance, South Africa, or some other country like uh, Namibia and the rest of them, just quite recently got their independence and some are even struggling, like uh, where, uh, Western Sahara issue there and so on and so forth. So we, we in our own case, we feel that uh, we should have what we call African solidarity. That's the, the organization of African unity. So our resources, whatever it is, were centered towards the decolonization of Africa. And that, that's why we, uh, we stick to the issue of the idea of non-alignment. Also, even though our, uh, our contacts, like the front and the Russia, and, and then the, the issue of uh, the, the, the concern of uh, United States and Europe, were because of their own interests. They your interest in what area? Most cases, you know, if we talk about the first uh, scramble for Africa, it was scramble for territories. Territory for what? In order to either to impact their, 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 their knowledge or to get much more territories, because some of them are called overseas territories, like the territory in Africa is uh, the, 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 the Portuguese. So the Portuguese territories are belonging to, 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 to Portuguese territory rather than uh, African uh, territory. Something with the French. They so those, pre, uh, those countries in, uh, the, the, as, as if they are part of, uh, uh, of, of France rather than maybe they can also, ha also have their this. So all these were the dominant issue in the first scramble for Africa. And Nigeria uh, played that role in trying to, uh, in creation of the, 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 uh, uh, the organization of African unity to fight colonialism and all that to be able to control their own resources. And this one has a lot of uh, impact on us up, even up to, 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 up, uh, up to, to today. Why, who, why do we send our oil to? Who buys our oil to? From? Who buys resources from us? Why do we get our resources from? So all these ones has a lot of influence on us uh, with, the, in, uh, with the issue of uh, new scramble for Africa. As I mentioned in my, state, in my paper, there are other interests now coming from Asia. For instance, when we, when we saw Japan in, in, in terms of come to Africa, it was in about 1990 when Japanese were talking about the issue of Tokyo Conference on African Development, starting to be, be, be believing that uh, Japan seemed to be very far from Africa. What has impact has Japan done in Africa in development? So they, in 1990, they created this Tokyo uh, yeah, Conference on African Development to be able to see themselves coming closer to Africa as a whole. So this is what, how I see the news camp for Africa able interested to see whether to go to Africa to assist it or to impact their, their, their influence or to be able to uh, uh, impact their, 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 their culture. Some of them, some of them are his culture. Some of them went to Africa in order to impact their language and so on and so forth. So this is the influence that yeah, rests with us up to, to this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador Nafisi, I'd like to ask you the same question and then also try to also start moving us in the forward direction too, as, as some of the other speakers have already mentioned. Will this race or the scramble for Africa determine global politics in the future? Is there also a way that Africa can in some way benefit from this? Uh, but, but how do you see what, what has happened since the fall of the, the, the Berlin Wall? Thank you. I think uh, <clears throat> Two or three things happened with the, fall of the, with the fall of the Berlin Wall. One, there was a shift in terms of the political outlook, not only in Europe, but even in Africa, in terms of the realization that a system that was so much entrenched within the Soviet bloc of socialism and communism, that it was a facade. That was paramount in Europe, and for the, especially for the Germans, for, for the East Germans. Now, it had a tremendous effect in Africa on those countries that had enshrined or had thought of the system as being a good system for them to advance their developmental goals. Countries like Mozambique, Angola, Tanzania, uh, which had enshrined these policies, they realized that it cannot, it doesn't seem to be watertight. So, it was bound to fail. They could have said failing, and it was bound also to fail in their system. So that's the second important point. Thirdly, they had then a choice. They were left alone, so to say. 
in this quagmire. They had a choice of abandoning the system as an ideal to achieve and look at the alternative. And the alternatives were there. The only thing to do is to reform their systems to be able to address real developmental challenges, you know, and enshrine and make use of the better capitalism, improve the quality of lives of their people using a different model altogether. So that was very, very fundamental and important. And therefore, the whole, most of the countries that enshrined, you know, communism and socialism even abandoned their slogans that had used to like Ujama, you know, uh, in, in Tanzania, uh, you know, and all the communist slogans that had been used. Then the people realized that the only best thing to do is that we should bring the best out of each and every one of us. The state cannot and will not be able to provide things for themselves. So, after 89, up to the early 1990s, these countries were left with a sort of a vacuum. A vacuum was created where these countries and most of them did not know what line they have to take until in the middle of the 90s where they realized that the only other best way to go about it is to make sure that they have alliances, clear alliances with those countries that would help them. And certain countries took advantage of this. China took advantage of this situation because previously China had not played a very, very important role in Africa. And even those countries that had been colonialists in the past, who had gone away like Britain, France, and so on, were no longer there because of the state of socialism. But now, after the creation of this vacuum, it was an opportunity now again for them to re look back and say, how can we further close this vacuum that has been created in, the, in terms of advancing our own social and economic gains and get these countries to be uplifted at the same time to provide us with what is mostly needed for us, which is energy, resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Hintz, uh, you're German, you're an economist, uh, and you're regional director for the KFW Development Bank. Uh, so in many levels, I'm curious to also hear your perspectives. Since 1989, how has also Germany's relationship with Africa changed or evolved? Well, thank you. Um, maybe just to add on what His Excellency the Ambassador Bordeaux from the Kingdom of Lesotho just said. Um, I think one also, one also, one another impact was there was a vacuum. There was no competition anymore. In fact, there was no alternative to many of the countries, so they had to look how to proceed. And I think that even also the, the reduction of conflicts in in Africa. If we take Mozambique, for example, I'm sure this had an impact on that. Um, so the the the, the uh, number of internal conflicts was reduced. And I also think that as most of the countries, they had to identify themselves where to go now. And there were not that many alternatives anymore. So then we had the, um, and also if we take the, the, the indicators, if we take Africa as a whole, from GDP, which you mentioned, but also if you look into the health system and the education system, Africa has improved over, over the last 20 years, more than ever before. And most likely also because um, those countries had to look for their own policy approach. And, um, and it was not in the, the times of the third way, which they were looking at uh, Ujamar, and, and a couple of these experiments were, were considered as something of the past. And, um, and, and companies, uh, sorry, and countries were looking forward and um, with on a, on a broad base, positive results. When it comes to Germany, well, for us, the situation has changed. I was in Zimbabwe. I was based in Zimbabwe when, um, when the wall came down. It was, in fact, down. And I, I remember that um, then one of the two German embassies had to be closed. So we had two. So suddenly, and um, the president by that time, in, and who is still the president, Mr. Mugabe, he asked, um, <laughs> he asked um, the German ambassador, so how does that work? So... Here in Zimbabwe, unfortunately, the, Germ the embassy from East Germany will be closed down. So I guess that um, then in Zambia, for example, West Germany will close down. And, um, and probably, so you'll do half, half and half. And, um, well, 
So uh, the explanation was, of course, that uh, the East Germany as such does not exist anymore, but we have one Germany. And um, for, for, um, for our approach, things became easier. There was um, no competition anymore. We, we were not involved into projects, for example, from a development assistance perspective, projects which were based on, um, let's say, on political competition, which was there before. There was a Soviet Union, if you take countries like Tanzania, for example. So it's an important country in East Africa. So for political reasons, we were involved. But we were not convinced whether this or that project was a sustainable one. Um, this has changed, of course. What did not materialize as we expected is the peace dividend. So by that time, um, not only in Germany, my family comes partly from Berlin, from East Germany. And um, in our family, I don't know anyone who was not crying when the war was, com was coming down. But, the, um, but what happened is that we were all expected, we were very enthusiastic by that time, that um, there will be a wave which started in Hungary, in fact, actually, going through Germany and which will reach the entire globe. This did not happen, unfortunately, not as we expected. What also did not happen is that um, we were expecting now all these huge funds which were being used to, for the armies in all the different countries, they would be made available now for more Im important things like fighting poverty and other things. This, unfortunately, did not happen, so this is disappointing. Uh, what happened is there were debt relief programs to a very large extent which with quite a number of countries. And um, overall, Africa, I would say, uh, find its way, in fact, and um, moved ahead. Thank you. Uh, my next question is addressed to each of the panelists, so just uh, we can see who volunteers first. Uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Uh, as these countries uh, move forward uh, towards post-industrial economies, will Africa become the next region for outsourcing and low-cost labor? Or sort of how do you see things developing? Who would like to respond first? Yes, I think uh, uh, even in my paper I mentioned that Africa is the next destination because it appears that maybe uh, the, because of the, the large markets available in Africa and the large resources available in Africa and with the peace that is uh, a relative peace that is taking place in Africa where there are no crises uh, going on, with democratization going on in Africa, with the human rights uh, at least uh, uh, protection and uh, of the people, and uh, it appears that Africa uh, is the next uh, attention. Uh, definitely because, uh, uh, but in Africa, as I said, uh, it, it cannot be Africa as a whole. It must be certain, certain po points, because there might be certain spots in Africa. And the, the, these spots, you look at Africa, although we have been always been talking of Africa, like Africa south of the Sahara. No, Africa not over like Egypt down, down, down to, to, to South, south Africa, there is, on east to, to, to West Africa. There are certain, certain countries that have some example to show. And it appears that if that they maintain that sustainability of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, conviction that uh, they are countries that can offer promise, it appears that there's definitely certain countries in Africa that my colleague talked about the regional uh, organization. You see, like ECOWAS, the Maghrib, the, 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 the Comesa and so on in, the, in Southern Africa and so on. Then this the regional organization are definitely uh, putting in areas they can uh, definitely attract uh, investors. A uh, lot of, uh, you know, investment or money, that doesn't go anywhere blindly. It goes where it can make profit. It goes where it is, it is, uh, it is safe. You cannot just move to a country that is tomorrow is a crisis. So we believe very much that uh, with uh, the, the, the progress made so far, and the fact that I'm, we also believe that some of the crises in Africa were foiled by ideological uh, support from outside. So, but if uh, uh, now we, have, uh, we don't have that kind of uh, problems, it appears that uh, uh, Africa will be uh, definitely, certain few countries in Africa will definitely shoot up, although they have already uh, they raised their hands and uh, just a matter of support. I believe that in the next uh, couple of years, 
we see a, more, a lot of attention going to Africa. Uh, you know, because uh, there was a, a country that we never knew that uh, anything can come out from there. The countries uh, that never had any resources at all. But today, those countries have a lot, a lot of attention. Even Sudan, the where people are talking about Sudan, a problem here and there, but a lot of scrambled even to go to, 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 to Sudan because there are a lot of resources there in the Sudan. Uh, Equatorial Guinea, some uh, 30 years ago, there was nothing there. But today, in fact, uh, if we read uh, the, 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 the story of that uh, country, it was just a, a, a place that uh, Britain didn't, they didn't like it, they didn't want it, so they just sold it for a few, few, few pounds to, to spend. So, and then they eventually discovered uh, a lot of resources underneath. So these are the, the problem that uh, definitely Africa is the next destination. Uh, and I believe we'll be able to uh, uh, come out like uh, the country re uh, recently mentioned. Because 30 years ago, nobody knew that uh, China or India or Brazil would be where they are. Thank you. I believe that Africa, at the moment, must be going to a stage of deep reflection. What is more important, the prevalence of democracy or eradication of poverty? We know that the United States, for example, its philosophy is to preach for each and every nation to become democratic and before we saw wealth being created mostly in a democratic nation. That was the sort of image came out of the end of the Cold War. But now we've got this China factor, the China phenomenon. In my view, China is never going to abandon, at least for a long time, its so-called communist philosophy, although it is no more a communist power in terms of its objectives to progress and, uh, and become predominant in world trade and in the financing sector. And I don't think the Chinese people themselves in the majority cares too much about democracy as opposed to making money and becoming prosperous. To them, if we are the richest nation, then we are on top. In my view, this is a factor which uh, is very much in consideration and must be considered by all those who are anxious now with the growth of China. China has become so powerful. About 10 years ago, there was a list for the 10 leading banks in the world. And one Chinese bank ranked as the 10th bank. Today, the three largest banks in the world are Chinese. And the economic indicator show more and more and more growth. I belong to an organization which was founded two years ago in France called the Forum, World Entrepreneurial Forum. And the World Entrepreneurial Forum was promoted in order to project the idea of the entrepreneur as not only being a creator of wealth, but also a promoter of social justice. Now, we already have this organization, which had its meeting under the patronage of President Sarkozy. We saw the presence of Chinese people coming to learn. And I remember when I was asked to make a comment, the comment which I made was that we should not when we analyze this situation, ignore the gene factor. Because there you've got all these Chinese who've been communists 
for generation generation suddenly there's opening up and what do we see overnight every one of these people is an entrepreneur a small capitalist going all over the world trying to make business so there comes the factor in terms of Africa characterized by its own geography by own civilization its own way of life today we have the challenge of uh, the free enterprise system of free trade and we see a West which in many cases had not taken full advantage of the Africa potential confronting a China which is very aggressively moving inward without interest as to what is going on internally into any one of these African nations. The main ambition is to sign deals to get raw materials to bring to China and turn into and also to get energy and power. Now in my view many nations in Africa which could have inspired as His Excellency said, very well put it, into manufacturing nation, industrialization, suddenly sees that the China factor, although in the short term is bringing a lot of money, could very well resolve into a situation where the manufacturing and industrial lies ambition uh, is not moving forward anymore. But this China factor is not only relevant to Africa, although since we are speaking of Africa, we just mentioned it, I think it's relevant also to the old world situation. So how do we see the future? There's no doubt that China is a very important factor that has a good an influential role to play with respect. How do we deal with China? What does the Chinese want of the world tomorrow? I believe that in this respect, Africa, the United States, and all the world should have a common interest to ensure that we have a China which is law abiding, a China which accepts to live in a multipolar world. At the moment, the Chinese are playing sunshine diplomacy, smiling ping pong diplomacy, and we have not reached a situation where the Chinese power has become so supreme that we start to confront Chinese arrogance. And all these, I think, must be worrying factors. Not that we have anything against Chinese growth, but I believe that none of us want to see a world which is unipolar, where we are dominated. This would be against the spirit of the future which we see. <coughs> oh, thank you. Uh, I, I think, first of all, we should look at we should do this. We should not, and, uh, and understand why you said so, Mark. Uh, but we should not compare China, or this big countries, Brazil, China, and India, with Africa as a continent. First of all, we should realize that this are, you are referring to a country vis-a-vis -a, -vis a continent, whose issues could be, for all intents and purposes, quite different. Having said so, Noting that, I'll still continue in the line of thought that you've mentioned. But we should, we should realize that. We, are co we, we should uh, compare apples with apples, not apples with oranges. Yeah? So, and with all due respect, but it's the, the question is pertinent. Let us look at Africa. What has Africa got? Africa has got it's a huge continent, huge potential with tremendous amount of resources, untapped, 
major challenges that deals with development infrastructure, poverty reduction, uh, po you know, alleviating poverty, uh, out of disasters, internal conflicts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and all those ills that you can mention. However, over the past couple of years since the fall of the Berlin Wall, as has rightly been mentioned, we have seen a number of improvements going on in general within the continent. So, within the continent. This is why it is important that the regional blocks should be supported to improve. You know, the ECOWAS, East African community, the SADC, because they will form a good basis and a foundation of something that can work, just like the European Union has, has shown and transformed from the European community to the present EU. And this is a strategy that the AU is encouraging. This is a strategy that most of the countries have realized within Africa that it is important when you talk about the United States of Africa, you cannot achieve that if you do not have the regional blocks showing the possibility of greater integration, both socially and economically and otherwise. So it is important that it should be strengthened. China has, over the years, done something else that most other countries can only dream of in terms of its development. They have been able to, in the past 10 years, move 20 million people out of poverty. No country has ever done that. And it will never do so. None. You have now have more millionaires in China than in the whole of the United States. The economic reforms that have happened are unsurpassed. Nevertheless, China still faces tremendous challenges in terms of addressing poverty. There are millions of people of Chinese that are still poor. There's tremendous kind of social injustice, whatever you can want to call it, human rights and so on, that is still there. But they are on the right path. And the reason why they're on the right path is because the Communist Party, which is governing it, is so solid behind setting out the priorities, moving ahead, fostering and utilizing the capitalist machinery, technology, science, to be able to advance in terms of where they want. Now, the challenge is that their energy resources are so limited and so outdone that, consequently, to move their developmental agenda, they need resources. And where can they get those resources? Because their coal has gone down, all their energy requirements are huge for their development, the only place where they can get them, where there's abundance of resources, is in, thank you, it's in Africa. So, they will look at that for their own strategic interest. What do they do? Why is it China appealing to most of the African countries in terms of what they, what they provide in terms of the scramble? You realize that in the 50s, or at the turn of the last century, most of the colonialists, their primary interest in colonizing was primarily for their own individual purposes, getting resources also from those countries to them to improve. But over the 50 years that they were there, with a few exceptions, with very few exceptions, where you could actually say they did have a legacy of some kind of an improvement. And those are the countries where they knew that they would always have a say in. But most of them, they were left impoverished over that period. Impoverished, with the exception of a few. So probably, I, I, don't, I think Seychelles did not follow the, the brand as much as the other ones, perhaps even Mauritius. But the rest of them, you name them, in South Africa, because they felt that it was a given. They'll never be able to live there. Their, their interests were always there. They would, they would be entrenched. So, but for the rest of them, they plundered their economies and did everything else. Now the question is, why is China doing this? Now, I believe that we should, or both the West and ourselves, we should look at what opportunities arise out of China's interest in Africa in addressing its energy need. This requires good leadership in terms of making sure that what China requires from Africa is commensurate with the needs of Africa on a win-win basis. But the truth is that China's aid or whatever it does in Africa is more for most intents and purposes not attached with strings. 
I'll give you an example. If I have to, if a country wants to, has identified a priority for them, for infrastructure, which is very, very important because Africa lacks infrastructure and the capacity and the know-how. To build a road from X to Z, if I were to ask the German government to support that in Lesotho, from the time that we make that request to the time that uh, KFW, KFW gives the okay, it will take five years, if I'm lucky, and that project fulfills the numerous criteria and requirements that are laid down, including good governance, human rights, you know, environmental protection, etc., etc., et and all those things. Now, if, we, if I go to China, if our government says, go to China, say, we need a road from A to Z because we have to move things and people need the road. Six months, six months at the most, with very soft interest rates, if at all, or they'll give it as a grant. This is appealing. This is, this is appealing. In conclusion, I believe that whenever we look at China's influence in Africa, we should not also lose track of the fact that that has actually set even also a scramble from countries like France, and I, and I must say with a dismal you know, record in terms of how it has plundered you know, uh, its former colonies, and still does. You know, uh, Great Britain, United States in Angola for oil, the scramble for oil, for the minerals, they are all in the same bracket. What is required then for us is to say, hey, what is it that we're getting out of this on a win-win basis? Yes, you'll get the timber. Yes, you'll get, you know, the minerals, but on a fair basis, fair trade. Give us the knowledge. Give us the capacity. Give us the technological know-how. Improve our, our resources also so that it truly is a win-win situation. But the scramble will go on until such time that the leadership that we have been talking about is there and there's a need and a will to improve the quality of lives of our people. Thank you. Well, if I may add, I fully agree we are far too slow. Whatever and whenever we get involved in a project, so we do our feasibility studies, we tender at each and everything, we are far too slow. But the question is still what is a more sustainable approach in the long run? So is it the road which is being built in six months with no tender and very quickly being done? Or is it the road which will last, um, let's say, a couple of more years? Okay, but, but nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, I fully agree we are too slow, and uh, which has been realized <laughs> and recognized quite a number of times. Um, maybe just briefly to that question, um, when, we, when we look into Singapore, totally different thing, they, when, when Singapore became an own state, the government by that time of Singapore didn't want to. They said to, they were part of Malaysia before, and Malaysia didn't want them because they didn't want the Chinese influence. So then they, they kicked, in fact, they kicked them out. And the, the leadership by that time from Singapore, uh, the president or prime minister, I don't know, he was on TV, and he's, he was crying, and he apologized to his people and said, sorry, we are just left as a malaria swamp here, and uh, we will hardly survive, so we need to do our level best, all of us. And what we know, all know what happened in the meantime. Now Singapore, I wonder whether the, they would make the same offer to Malaysia once again. So nonetheless, so the, um, what, 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 this is a clear indication to me what politics can achieve. So when it comes to the private sector development and when we talk about low-cost labor in Africa, which would mean employment, employment creation as one of the main challenges, not only in Germany we would say it's our main challenge, but in Africa, of course, the situation is um, much more different and more, more challenging. Um, but then the private sector comes in once again. So we had that a couple of times today. So um, the frame conditions must be right from the private sector, but of course this is not only transparency, which also has been mentioned, but then qualification of staff, productivity is an issue, but also the infrastructure. When you take a country, in, um, a landlocked country in Africa, it take, can take easily 70 to 100 days before the goods reach the next harbor. So this is, um, this is another challenge. And... Um, title deeds when it comes to agriculture, so, the, um, so that the farmers are in a position to borrow, 
which is also very essential. Um, and f but I'm also positive, and I'm quite optimistic. So we, we have a couple of positive indicators. Um, the East African community has been mentioned. When, when the, the treaty for the common market will be in place, very likely by the middle of this year, then there will be a free flow of labor. So then there will be the Kenyans, who are better qualified than the neighboring countries. They will flow the markets very quickly. They will f get into Tanzania, into Uganda, Burundi, and Rwanda. And, um, but then this will be, will be in, the, for the, for in the short term, this will be very challenging to the other countries. But in the midterm, they will benefit from that, because then there's competition. They would have to deal with that kind of situation. And in the mid and long term, I'm also quite optimistic that um, the economic base, and particularly the private sector, and this is where the employment should be created, will benefit. Thank you very much. My uh, third and last question before I turn it over to the audience uh, is a little bit linked to what you were just talking about. Uh, this week with the Young Leaders, we've debated in a number of cases the sort of comparison, uh, European Union, African Union. And I wanted to ask, is that a fair comparison? Is that a helpful comparison? Many look at Europe with a lot of respect and say, look at what Europe has accomplished. You know, this uh, region that was at war in so many cases is now at peace. Uh, this region that was devastated after the Second World War is an economic you know, super success if you look at the Euro. Uh, is this a fair or healthy comparison? Uh, and in answering that question, I want to also remind you, you have a group here of very high potential in the sense uh, the next generation of young leaders uh, from not only the African continent, the African diaspora, and also Europe. If you could offer them one piece of advice in the context of sort of new strategies, new approaches to sustainable development in Africa, what would that be uh, to sort of wrap this up? Uh, and then at that point, I would then like to uh, invite further questions from the audience. So I'm not sure who would like to go first, but I would, I'd love it if each one of you could, could please answer that question. Very shortly, yes. <clears throat> Comparisons should always be made because if you don't compare, you'll never know whether you're on the right track or not. And the EU is a good example. If you recall how the EU became where it is now from the time when it became as a dream of the EC up to now, it has gone through tremendous steps and stages with, amongst others, you know, a country like Britain always being, you know, ostracized or not being allowed to get in because it had its own interest in joining the EU. Because they had lost their empire and they did not have anything else where to look for. And Charles de Gaulle said, no, 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 you Brits, we don't want you at the moment because they wanted to get in because of some other hidden agendas. It had a hidden agenda. But the important thing is that certain things happened. There were good building blocks to that were done. The realization that each and every country is unique and important. It brings in into this union its strengths. We have certain individual strengths as a country. We set, have certain expertise. Let us pull our resources together. Let us work towards a common goal. Fundamental. And the respect for individual countries' rights and laws. That was the basic thing. So for the regional groupings, the same principles should happen. For the SADAC, for the ECOWAS, for the realization that, yes, we may be different, we may be diverse in our way, but we, if we work together to attain a certain goals in terms of economic integration, regional integration, sharing of resources, working towards improvement of the quality of our people, and then easing movement of goods and people and having a symbol, a single common currency that identifies us as a region. That is important. Then you can build upon, you know, you can improve. So it is a good comparison. You should look at it. See other ones that have been tried to be emulated but did not work. It is also important. So I believe it should. It is a good comparison. Good thing is that look at the lessons, look at it. It's a model that you can use and you know, look at the strengths and weaknesses. But one thing sure is that the EU, as it expands, there are tremendous challenges that it faces in terms of bringing, you know, the gap between the new ones that are coming in and the ones that are already there. And then which, which also comes with different values and cultures, which has taken those other countries more than 50 years. And then you have countries, and I'll mention them, countries like then Turkey, 
coming in with a different cultural and ideological outlook altogether. It is a source of concern that you cannot just jump into the pod immediately. So they will have to stand, or Bulgaria, they will have to stand certain tests to make sure that the other members understand them, they understand them, so that integration becomes better. Thank you. Yes, I think we've got a lot to look at Europe. But there would be no Europe as we know Europe today without first the Entente, which was created between France and Germany. After the Second World War, both nations had people who hated each other. The French hated the Germans and vice versa. But it took two great leaders Charles de Gaulle and Conrad Adenauer. That's where leadership is so important. To rise above the level of pure politics, to the level of statesmanship, and face the reality that Germany and France were committed to be neighbors. Either they carried on fighting each other, or they had to go towards the root of this entente. And this is the foundation of the European Common Market, which evolved into European Community, and the very base, Franco-German collaboration. Something else of also happened within Europe, which has a profound effect. And again, I like the importance of statesmanship towards the reunification of Germany. These two nations, uh, one nation divided by ideology, then the other side was prepared to accommodate. Western Germany was prepared to accommodate East Germany in the interest of a greater Germany, in the interest of greater national unity. And the people of West Germany, let's face it, were matured enough to see that maybe it would be necessary to make certain sacrifices in the interest of a better solution, better peace, better understanding. And we followed that and we saw this has been, if you want, uh, the center development was finally the breakdown of the Berlin Wall. So I think Africa must also rise up now. Let's stop fighting about a few borders of territory. Africa, continent of plenty, right? We must search for that leadership, that statesmanship leadership, and get all African nations educated in the philosophy of Africa first, the state nation second, and the rest after. What is the best of interest of Africa must predominate. And that's where I think lies the challenges of cultural diplomacy in the task which lies ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <coughs> On the issue of a uh, uh, question of uh, comparison, I think uh, as my colleague uh, stated, yes, they need uh, because of uh, the need to share experience then also, uh, I think determines how we can uh, move forward in your own uh, uh, predicament or problem because uh, we live in a globalized world with the issue of globalization. So share, sharing experiences, what is happening in Europe, even in Africa we try to, to, to model our, our regional organization based on Europe because the EEC, Economic Community of uh, the Commission of Europe and it's a metamorphosis into the EU, rather than African, the, the, the OAU, now we, are, now we are calling it uh, the, 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 the AU, the African Union. So the, we are moving towards that, uh, the, that uh, kind of uh, uh, gaining experiences from other countries where, so that we can be, uh, be able to uh, model our own system. And so uh, in the, I think there's a need for us to have, because there's already, a, Somebody may, may ask that question. What is the standard? Who judges the standard of good governance? Who judges that the human right is being respected? I think that we should understand that human right is universal. 
is interdependent and interrelated. So we cannot say African human right is lower than the European human right. It is not. It is human right is that, for instance, uh, we talk of the issue of torture, inhuman and degrading treatment or punishment is the same, either in Africa or in Europe. So it is there is no lower standard in terms of comparison. So there is need for us to see what is done in other countries, uh, and so. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the best thing to do is to develop with your culture. Africa should develop with its own culture. And like we can see in, in Asia. Asian, even though in Germany they are encouraging a lot of development with culture. Culture is seen as a, a developmental issue. It should not be something that will be relegated. Because we believe that own our, our culture are not superior. Uh, our culture is not... Uh, 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 a substandard, which is not correct. Your language, the language you speak, you should uh, do, uh, develop with it because it is easier for you to develop with your own culture. So I think that's why the need for us to compare and see what is happening there, but not necessarily copy exactly what they are doing there because you see Asia, uh, India, uh, China, the rest, they, 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 they develop with their, their, within their own culture. So the, the they have some platform in which they can also uh, uh, move forward in that aspect. On the issue of uh, what advice could I give to young leaders like you, I would say uh, be courageous, rise up against oppression and injustice. Thank you. Well, I, I just come to the second part of your question. And... Um, well, it's not up to me to give anyone any advice, but I, I would have a wish. And uh, without any racial bias, I would um, make a split between those of you with an African background and the non-Africans. For those of you with an African background, I would wish that you become ambassadors of your country. Mm. Take care that, um, well, having in mind with your broad experience from countries in Germany where you are presently, um, having that privilege of studying abroad, gaining so much knowledge from here and there, I would wish that, that you become ambassadors of your country, go back one day and make sure that the message is spread about your country and how to improve the situation over there. For those of the non-Africans, i like to thank you, first of all, that you take care in such a session. I say I, I'm always very pleased to see Germans and others who take who have an interest into Africa. This I also think is something very important. You, those of you I would like to encourage get involved in Africa in a wider sense from our European perspective. Travel to Africa, fall in love with Africa. And um, you will see what people say as well, well when you're once in Africa you can get out of Africa but Africa can't get out of you anymore. And um, I can fully confirm that. And then another wish I have to my immediate neighbor to the left, that when we have the world championship now, the soccer, um, we meet in the final, and, um, and the better one should win. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to take this opportunity to now open up the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, maybe, uh, Capri or Katrina, you can assist me. I'll just, we'll take one of the microphones from here. And if you could just raise your hands, please. Um, we could do that also. And actually, maybe if you could also introduce yourself when you make the, the question, just so we know a little bit about your background, would be great. Um, so I don't know, maybe should we start in the back and move our way forward? Or I don't know, ladies first. I think your hand was first, maybe to the left. Would you mind coming forward? Or will that work logistically? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then just maybe just say briefly where you're from. Uh, and also, if you'd like to direct the question to someone specifically or to the whole panel. Okay. Uh, Siham from Morocco, um, and actually I have more comment than a question. Um, you, you first, uh, you've, uh, you have been talking about geopolitics, which is mainly about power, about one single country is getting at the top, being a hegemon. It was the case for UK for a long time, then with the US after the Second World War. And um, I strongly believe that the, the world cannot be such a, I mean, it's such a, such a form uh, mainly because of globalization. So today we're speaking of the G3, G7, even G20. 
uh, we have the e European Union um, presence, we have the presence also of the emerging market like China, uh, India and Brazil. So how can Africa take advantage of such success stories and, uh, and, and go forward? Like today we all know where we, where we want to be in the future, but uh, from where can we start today? And uh, uh, Sir uh, has just, uh, uh, he, he told us uh, like a few uh, minutes ago to, unless of coming with the problem to come, uh, to come also out with the solution. So I've been thinking about a solution and I hope that, um, that most of you would agree with me. Um, uh, I really think that um, like uh, most of the African countries, they, they have uh, help from, from, from outside. Like uh, I'm not speaking of, uh, of uh, financial aid, but also technical assistance, whether from EU, whether from US or from the UN system. Uh, this is good. But I think that maybe Africans should take advantage uh, from, from those aids and, and, uh, and foster them to create or to reinforce a national capability or capacity and come out with national initiatives. Those national initiatives sh should, be, um, should involve the government, the, um, the, um, the private sector, and uh, mainly the, um, the social, uh, the social uh, society. So if th th all those parts get gathered to, to, uh, to, uh, to push out um, uh, a national initiative and go forward to, uh, for instance, create a program to eradicate poverty, to uh, facilitate access to health and to uh, education, um, to, uh, to, to like um, um, also help um, creating a sort of good governance within the country, and also for, for cases where there is conflict to uh, kind of uh, uh, help uh, those countries or those regions to come over those, uh, those uh, conflicts. This is broadly uh, national, nationally or externally. And maybe at the external, um, uh, I would say, level, maybe uh, encourage a sort of, even I don't like the label of South-South, but it is like that, we have North and South, and encourage the, the South-South uh, cooperation. Uh, maybe um, uh, we have the, the uh, I mean, uh, most of the African countries look for, for, uh, for European, I mean, uh, partnership and so on, but maybe to start looking first uh, uh, within your neighbor, close neighbor, and create a sort of um, cooperation, African or, or, or South-South cooperation, it will be, uh, I'm sure that the, the result will be, uh, will be very good. And it's uh, just uh, uh, a start and uh, hope that uh, it will give, uh, I mean, excellent uh, results. Thank you. No, or should we take the next question then? Or okay, uh, let's take a few more maybe from the left and then I'll take a few from the right just so I don't lose track. I think, yeah, maybe let's go to the back you first, please. And then maybe one more and then we'll go to the right. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, my contribution will be will not really be question, but uh, it will be more of a remark. Could you say where you're from, also? Oh, sorry. Okay, I'm from Nigeria, uh, from Lagos, Nigeria. Yeah, I think uh, essentially we're talking about uh, how we're going to move Africa forward, you know, especially through sustainable development. And uh, we're talking about uh, the scramble for Africa. But uh, one point I want to make here is that, you know, as Africa, we also need to be very careful. You know, uh, because today we're talking about uh, China and the West attempting to, you know, to shift focus, you know, to Africa. Africa need to be very careful. Uh, why we need to be very careful is uh, predicated upon the fact that we need to, you know, uh, ascertain the genuity of that focus to Africa. Because over time, you realize that this is not the first time that you see the West, you know, shifting focus to Africa in terms of different developmental strategies. And you find that, that at the end of the day, nothing comes out of it. Since 1980, we've had several, you know, starting from, you know, uh, LPA, Lagos Plan of Action, even up to NEPAD, 
Okay, but you realize that, you know, at the end of the day, nothing comes out of you. And that's why it is imperative that, you know, we need to, as African, we need to ascertain the genuity, you know, the, the, the real commitment of, you know, these uh, Western powers or China, as the case might be. Of course, I raised the question here yesterday that, you know, why the West is, you know, why now? Why is it that it is now that, you know, the, the West is actually talking about a Marshall Plan for Africa? And the question has always been that, it is perhaps basically because China is attempting to muggle up Africa now. And that's why the West felt, no, hey, you know, wait a minute, we need to be very careful. Yeah, we need to be very careful. China is, you know, is moving, you know, in Africa. And as a result of that, we also need to do what we also need to move. And so the, the point I'm making there is that it is important that, you know, we, uh, you know, establish that as a matter of fact. Uh, the second fact is that for Africa to be able to move, there is need for us to actually do what? To, 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 to expand the decision-making process in the world. Today, we talk about Washington Consensus. We talk about IMF. We talk about World Bank. How many African leaders you know, are at that level to be able to you know, uh, push their position at that level? You, you virtually find none. And as a result of that, the point, even when we talked recently, uh, in about uh, two or three years, but when we were talking about expanding the Security Council, you find out that, you know, the, the, the West, they've been recalcitrant, you know, in terms of absorbing, you know, uh, 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 you know our continental leaders, let me put it that way, you understand, into, you know, that uh, 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 unit of the United Nations. And so you find out that when the situation is still like that, you find out that, you know, Africans, you know, operate at a very vulnerable level. And as a result of that, it becomes extremely very difficult for them to be able to, you know, advance development. So the point we're making is that, you know, uh, you know uh, Western powers, China coming into Africa, we need to ascertain their sincerity. And secondly is that we need to do what? Expand the decision-making process it with a view to ensuring that it accommodates, you know, Africa as a basis of ensuring that, you know, we develop at a partnership level, not at a prescription level. Thank you. May I make a comment? I think the point you have raised is an important point. However, what's important for Africa is not so much the question who takes maximum benefit of Af Africa. The West or China? The more important point is to move Africa from where it is to better heights. And this must be addressed by the African people themselves. In conclave, the African people must decide, are we happy where we are? And face the truth and the reality of your situation. Are we getting the best deal which we deserve in comparison to this competitive world where people are moving ahead and if we don't also keep pace and move ahead, we're going to fall more and more behind. Now in the history of the world, we've had the experiment, for example, which Japan made, when for many years it closed its door to external penetration and examined itself. And the Japanese emerged from a nation which was known as producer of cheap goods into a nation of technology. Proud, they went and started inventing and producing. Now we spoke about Singapore. We call you in Singapore after they'd been kept away from the Federation of Malaysia. Addressed his people in Singapore. He said, you know, we are an island with no natural resources. Therefore, we must think ahead and we must one point be more advanced. So what did the Konyu do? Where well, everybody in the region, the children were starting to look, go to school at 8 a.m. Rukalgu said, this is the privilege of those who've got resources. In Singapore, you must wake up, our children must wake up 7 a.m. and be at school at 7 a.m. Catch up. One hour more. I believe we must face the reality of the situation that we are now 
moving towards the digital age, where we have got to study and acquire a lot of different uh, scientific method technology to catch it. So this is no time for us to waste, no time for Africa to waste. We must get down, and that is where I believe it's very important for the African nation to converge towards a cohesion aimed at giving pride to the African people and give it to African people the position which they deserve. And this can only be achieved by the African people themselves. Thank you. Now I would suggest maybe grouping the last two questions, or do we have two? Or how? Have one more, one more I'm sorry, you want to ask? Her? Okay, sure. So that's all right. One question uh, from my colleague, Ruman, and uh, then we'll be, please. A short one. Okay. Um, I was born in Lithuania. I was born in Lithuania, and um, I don't know if you ever had the chance, all of the speakers and, and uh, participants, to go there, but... 20 years ago, if you had uh, went there, I don't think that you could have, fa you could have found a lot. Um, there was almost nothing there. Um, uh, you, you, you could have found over there poor people uh, with no infrastructure, infrastructure and uh, in a very, difficult, a very difficult situation. 20 years, if you go to get today to Vilnius, or if you go today to Budapest, if you go to the, you, you go today to Warsaw, you will find uh, that you will you will find out you will see that the, the, those countries made a huge um, a huge progress and and you can see that they are going into some kind of a right a right the, the right direction. Now I know that a lot of countries in Africa got um, already got independence many years ago. And, but still, if you, if you go, I didn't go to Africa, the only, uh, only African country that I visited uh, was Egypt, but still, uh, I think that um, most of, uh, in many countries, you cannot see such, such, a, such, a, um, s such good progress like you, you can see in, the, in, in East Europe. My question is, as, as a worried citizen of this world, <laughs> as I feel, I'm a f I feel myself as a citizen of this world, what is what is the main reason what is what is stopping what is i see that africa got the the sympathy of the world everybody wants that good things will happen to africa so at least this every almost every western government is contributing to africa uh, we all want uh, we all see that uh, we all see that the africans also want to get uh, to get the situation into into to be to bring the situation into a, a better place so what is what is stop? And, 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 and as an economist, it's very difficult for me, and I'm ex an experienced economist. It's very difficult for me to see what is really stopping Africa to be uh, uh, to be the next China, or to be the next uh, uh, Poland, or to be the next uh, 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 East Germany, maybe, or something like that. Thank you. I would like to ask uh, to to uh, any, any speaker. I, I would like us to, to start from this, this premise, uh, my dear experienced economist. <laughs> First of all, your observation may be correct, uh, and congratulations for Lithuania for having achieved that in, in 20 years. And, and I'm not being cynical, by the way, I'm, I'm honest. But I think we should start, we should look at the difference in terms of development. The premises are completely different, completely different from the historical perspective and the influences that have happened to make Africa to be, or some of the African countries to be where they are now, you know? Lithuania was never colonized. What is your population? About three million. Three million. <laughs> On the verge of, uh, the, next to Finland, up there, uh, Russia. in Russia. You have never had even in your history, conflicts, both internal or even around you, you have a long-standing history that you have acquired through from your neighbors and even in Europe. 
you have never been poor, even by all, your own definition of poverty, not to mention about our definition of poverty. So you, you have been completely different. Now, what has happened to most of these African countries that we lump together as Africa? First of all, their development, if you talk about anything else re that resembles development, with an exception of, and I don't talk about Northern Africa, Egypt, with a long history of you know, uh, ancient civilization, but any country that has got some kind of resemblance of you know, development, you talk about very few, talk about perhaps Mauritius, South Africa, uh, and a few of them, right? But over the years, 200 years ago, most of those countries you know, could not even read and write with the exception of the ones that, you know, in Timbuktu. They could not even read and write. There were no hospitals. Right? So, it's a tremendous leap. You are leaping from... <laughs> I don't even... A quantum leap. These countries are doing a quantum leap. Yes, it's a quantum leap that is unprecedented. So, the challenges are tremendous. And they cannot be solved even when you look at post-colonial time, you know, for the past 50 years. It is definitely going to take another generation or generations even to reach perhaps to the standard where Lithuania, your country, was 100 years ago. But it does not mean that that should be the defining moment as to how we should develop the most important thing is that we are on the right track. We are learning as we go around. And there is progress towards moving in the right direction. Thank you. Africa, we must also stop being our own people who become brilliant, who become educated. Makarele College, I said in Uganda, I was growing up, everybody had great respect, the best, one of the best colleges in the African hemisphere. I was only 18 years old, now I'm 70, and there were African pilots, but we see all this war which has taken place. We must stop and we must go to the field of education and awareness with a lot of determination. And Africa has got the potential we can see. See this man, how he eh, communicated with us. A man of quality of character and then he went us to that period about how to bring a better leadership. African and a great, I know so many very, very intelligent. Africa has got it all. But we need organization. And there must be... What did the West do after independence? Common market. Was that a byproduct, a result of Africa's independence? That Europe, in its wisdom, decided, let us, some of us, sacrifice some of our own national sovereignty in the interest of the creation of a bigger unity so that we can still control the prices, control this, and control that. So I believe that, uh, as I said before, the future must be left. And I think we have gone now to a period where there's a new awakening. We are settling down. After we became independent, many African leaders really taught really that all the problems Africa was due to the colonizers. I would say that we also benefited a lot. Not all the problem, it was not a, a, a one with channel only. And then we had all this process where we changed names, interfered with the civil service, and went backward, went backward in so many areas, there was one area I was just uh, thinking about it as faded from my memory, but uh, I can see that the potential is there. And again, I think Africa is going to rise. And it's starting, you know where? 
in Berlin at a conference of International Cultural Diplomacy Institute. You are the one to go ahead, my friend. Now, I don't want to talk too much because they have already mentioned, but I have to also mention to you that uh, definitely there are, uh, as I said, there are countries in Africa that have really moved forward. There are countries that, that migrated or, that in fact, have left being classified as least developed countries. They are no longer least developed countries. They have moved forward. I mentioned, uh, particularly Sudan, who, in 20 years ago, was the leader of the least developed countries in the United Nations. It is no longer so. In Kotera, Guinea, when I was a young diplomat, I knew very much when they were coming to my country, just neighboring countries, to them, to give them just small uh, assistance for schools, to, for feeding them. That country is no longer a least developed country. We have Botswana. These are countries that have now have definitely gone forward. And then the wars in Africa is no longer there. So as he said, when, when I was in Ethiopia in the 80s, during Mengusu's time, in life has been very, very, very difficult. There was curfew from 6 o'clock until the following morning. There were killings all over, up and down. Farming, crisis, and so on. But today, you go to Ethiopia, it's no longer the same. So there's a lot of tremendous progress has been made. Even though there are some, a lot of countries that have fallen down. In West Africa, for instance, uh, uh, Côte d'Ivoire was a model for us. But when the leadership fell apart, there, has been, there was a problem. Liberia was a model for West Africa. But because of the intrigues, it became somewhat else. In fact, the best universities in, for us in West Africa, English-speaking countries, was Furabe College in Sierra Leone. But what happened after the crisis? But I believe that in the last 15, 20 years, Africa, uh, African countries have risen and they're moving forward. And I believe that there's no, in fact, no, maybe one or two, only one country, that are a military regime in Africa. You see, that is uh, Guinea Conakry recently. But virtually every country in Africa is democratic. So I think with this, I think we are making a lot of progress. Thank you. Okay, if the panel will permit me, I would still like there were a few, many hands there. It's maybe three very brief final questions and then a final response from each uh, panelist. Is that okay? I know we're a little bit behind schedule. So maybe I think you've been waiting the lady on the right uh, first, and maybe you uh, also from the right. And then uh, I said I would go to this side. Uh, maybe is that okay? Yeah, in the front. And then we have some from that side already, some from this side. Please. Um, hi, I'm Maria. I'm from Bradford University, Peace Studies Department. Uh, before I give the question, I'm going to say something, criticize my own field, because I, I got some criticized before uh, the last question that, uh, that I got. Um, I, I have the feeling, and maybe it's I'm tired, maybe jet lag, but I have a fe uh, feeling after I hang out the whole day with Nigerians today, um, so also they've influenced a bit my thinking. Um, that there is a strange thinking about Africa, in Africa and outside Africa, about the problems in Africa. And I will first criticize my own field. Um, after elections in Kenya and um, after problems which came up uh, recently in Zimbabwe, uh, some of the practitioners of our department went down to Kenya and Zimbabwe and they were kind of behind the agreement, the governmental agreement that was created they are very unhappy with themselves. They're very unhappy with the, what they did. And uh, why they are unhappy? Because they did what they did in order to <laughs> act on the humanitarian crisis that was rising, on the violence that was rising. But in the long term, they've created a horrible situation because they gave a green light and they justified that if you didn't want the election and you start to make violence on the streets, you actually may end up being in the government. You may, may, may end up being a part of the government. So they are not really happy with the long-term consequences of what they did. And there are big concerns in Kenya and in Zimbabwe what will happen in the next months. So that's a criticism of our short thinking of, of my own field. But also, when you were mentioning the, um, the, the deals that you're doing with China, I also have a feeling, yes, you're getting the deals for now on, but the long-term ideas 
for, for Africa, the long-term vision is not, I, I don't feel it. And then as my Nigerian friend said, uh, you know, the, the vision is needed. You've mentioned uh, comparing European Union and African Union. Well, I think you're a bit ambitious because if you look at European Union, countries that join European Union were countries that were strong, not only economically, but also in their own identity. In order to create a union, you need, you need to, each of these countries needed to give something up from their own, I don't know, sovereignty, as you said, their own um, economy, to create it something bigger. And I'm not really sure are African countries that strong to give up and, uh, you know, what is really the long vision? And um, sociologist Zygmunt Bauman said uh, that Europe does not really exist. He wrote a very good book, actually. Europe doesn't actually exist. European Union doesn't, doesn't actually exist. It's just a vision. It's a vision of people who have will to do something like European Union. So I think a vision is needed and a lot of goodwill. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. And I would ask the next question, please, to come right up also. Yes, but you. you. Uh, and then I just learned our one panelist needs to leave in five minutes for the airport. And so I think this maybe is the last question. You can then give your final remarks first, and then we can, can continue. Please. Hi. Uh, my name is Ibrahim from Guinea. Uh, my question, we talked a little bit earlier about outsourcing and how um, the ambassador from Nigeria believed that Africa is the next destination. Um, there are a lot of good things about outsourcing. You have middle class that rise up and a lot of good things, but there are also bad things about it. You have sweatshops, the presence of, um, you know, la labor rights and all these other issues. Have your government thought about that if Africa is the next, if your country is the next destination? And what are some concrete um, initiatives that your government, that you think your government should um, should enact if Nigeria is the next destination. Thank you. Okay. Or maybe very briefly then the last question. If it's very brief, then, then please. please. Okay, right. who's next? Uh, Mr. Hule from Chad, but I come from Burkina Faso. Uh, I would like to ask a question about Central Africa, the central part of Africa. Uh, in your comment analysis, uh, you talk about uh, the southern part of Africa and the eastern part of Africa in terms of ECOWAS or SADC. I would like to, I would like to know if uh, in the southern part of Africa there is not an organization like uh, SADC or ECOWAS, and uh, what are the challenges of uh, those countries? And I would like to know also if they have uh, the same level of progress than uh, the other part of Africa. Thank you. <coughs> Pardon. Um, well, without answering your question, where we have more prominent uh, speakers here, um, I just like to apologize first of all because I have to leave, and uh, second, I also like to thank all of you, as um, I very much enjoyed the lively discussion, and it makes me even more optimistic for the future of this wonderful continent called Africa. Thank you. I think uh, uh, responding to the specific question, talking about the issue of uh, Africa, the next destination, and then the idea of the question of outsourcing, uh, we believe that uh, um, definitely uh, we also, also uh, said I have to address this issue uh, cautiously because uh, there are some uh, uh, problems uh, here and there. I know the issue of crime, the issue of uh, fraud. These are some of the, 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 the questions. Uh, even when I was sitting there, somebody uh, brought the idea of uh, uh, people writing letters to their companies uh, requesting for uh, uh, something that 30 million uh, uh, dollars available for them to, to process. And uh, he was talking to me just uh, uh, when we were having tea. So these are some of the cautious uh, uh, elements in doing business in uh, uh, so government has put in place uh, institution in order to attract and to make it easier as I mentioned in my paper that uh, we have the question of, uh, uh, of uh, agreement because usually government what they do is they do government to go uh, government uh, uh, kind of uh, framework to attract and to be able to uh, address the, the specific needs of, uh, of businesses 
And so if you talk of my country being, if it, is, it be, become uh, the next destination, definitely we are not doing so in, isolate, in isolation. Because ECOWAS as, a, as a, an organization is called Economic Community of West African States. It has to address the economy. It's unfortunate that the political element that was never envisaged in it dominated the, uh, the, the, the organization into uh, the question of ECOMOG, the question of uh, crisis and so on. But that was not the aim of ECOWAS. So initially, it was meant to attract investment, to make market available, to be able to pull the resources together within the whole of ECOWAS countries. So Nigerian uh, interest is not isolated to Nigeria alone. It is in, it is, it is in relation to the, Africa, uh, the other uh, West African countries. Like in the EU, the German uh, position is not isolated to the, to the issue of the, the EU. So we are working in tandem to what other neighboring countries do because what affects us in Nigeria affects Benin completely because they are just our next neighbor, affects uh, uh, Niger. Affect Chad. So we work in, in a kind of a, uh, in a concern with, with this. So we have this institution to make it make a, a, a business easier for them. So this, and then the market for uh, Nigeria is, is, a, is a market for West Africa. What happened in Senegal affects us uh, directly in Nigeria because we have free movement of goods and services. In fact, I have an Equus passport. That's what we call it. So we can make easy movement of people. So, so we also make the same thing. In fact, most of our uh, people clear their goods from, from Cotonou, so clear their goods from, 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 uh, from, from, from Togo. They go as far as that. So we already have this, uh, this uh, machinery put in place to make easy uh, market for West Africa. It's something like investment. Some, some people uh, side the, the, like our banks now. There are so many Nigerian banks in other where uh, Equus country. So why was that? Why were we trying to add, uh, do so? So machinery have been put in place. This has never been there before in the last 10, 20 years because we were uh, occupied with a crisis in the, uh, Liberia, crisis in Sierra Leone, and crisis in the, in the neighboring countries. But now that things are quiet, now they address the real issue of the economy. So I, I'm, I believe that with this machinery put in place, collectively with, our, with, uh, with, with the other Equus countries, we can be able to address some of the specific issues you are, you are talking about. 